At the outset, it'd be useful to define some terms that, so that there is no confusion over what we're going to be talking about in this talk. Islam is a religion that is followed by nearly one billion people. And the word Islam means submission, by which they mean submission to Allah. Followers of Islam are known as Muslims. They recognise only one God whom they worship under the name of Allah. The sacred book for Muslims is known as the Quran, which they believe Allah sent down to the Prophet Muhammad, who was the last of the prophets of God. So what comes to mind when we think about Islam or indeed Muslims? When the author was a child, he lived in Sydney suburb of Lakemba in Australia. His parents sold their house to a family from Lebanon. They were a fine, hard-working and upright family, as were most of the Muslim neighbours who had already moved into his street. Lakemba is now the centre of Muslim culture in Australia. The man who calls himself the Aman of Australia, the chief Muslim cleric in Australia, operates from a mosque in Lakemba. The part of Sydney is now overwhelmingly Muslim. About 25 years ago, he worked with a Muslim gentleman in Sydney. He was a fine family man, hard-working and very pleasant. He attended his mosque at least weekly and prayed five times a day. One day, he was asked the question, what he said in his prayers, and he rattled off the words in Arabic. He was asked what the Arabic word, words meant, and he confessed that he had no idea. He was born in Turkey and he was fluent only in Turkish and English. This fact reflects an important principle that we find hard to understand. For devout Muslims, only Arabic is valid as a spiritual language. Allah can only be worshipped in Arabic. The holiest book for Muslims is the Quran. They believe that the Quran was inspired by God, whom they call Allah. In that regard, they are like us in that we regard the Bible as the inspired word of God. The key difference is, however, is that they hold Allah inspired the words and the grammar of the Quran and that only the original Arabic form is valid. So all other translations of the Quran are invalid. About 20 years ago, the author spent a week in Dubai on the Persian Gulf on a business trip. The local businessman he met was a well-educated, sharp and canny as any businessman you might meet in London or New York. He was honest, hard-working, clever and pleasant. About 10 years ago, the author arranged for a young graduate from Turkey to come to Australia to work for about a year. This gentleman was without question the most intelligent individual with whom he had ever worked. He too was a Muslim, highly educated, very polite and extremely hard-working. So why do we relate these anecdotes? The truth is, is that we have had relatively few dealings with Muslim people in the author's life. That sample of four that we have just recited is hardly a statistically valued import. But all those, Mus but all those Muslims with whom he had met or had direct contact have been highly principled, hard-working and upright, and most of them very bright. That is not the general view held of Muslims in Australia. Many Australians are very fearful of Muslims and would like to see them removed from Australian society. Perhaps they link the, difference, the different values of Muslims with those of Muslim terrorists in places like Iraq and Indonesia. It is true that the Islamic religion has spawned a range of terrorists who have disrupted life in many parts of the world. In the author's job, he has had some responsibility for security of assets, and this brings him into direct contact with ASIO and other security agencies. ASIO makes no secret of the fact that the single biggest terrorism threat in Australia is the threat of extremist Islamic violence. It is true that even Muslims who do not advocate terrorism have values that are at odds with those of Australian society. But the mere fact that they have different views from those of most Australians does not make them inferior. In fact, 
I would suggest that many of these values of mainstream Australians leave much to be desired. In matters of dress, for instance, the modest manner in which Muslim women present themselves may seem extreme, but it is indefinitely better than the immodest and slovenly style of so many young Australian women. The only thing that sets any man apart from other men in terms of morality is his attitude toward God. All men have a choice. They either choose to serve and honour God in their lives or they choose to turn their back on him. All men in this world are in one of these two camps. They either serve and honour God or they do not. Ultimately, it does not matter whether you are an Australian or Indonesian, whether you were born Muslim or Christian or any other religion. What matters is your relationship with God. The purpose for us in this talk is not to attack Muslims for being Muslims. What we wish to do is examine some of the claims made by Muslims and how we can respond to them, especially in relation to the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. It is the only true arbiter of what is right and wrong and it will be our guide in our considerations in this address. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 8. Muslims respect the Christian Bible as the inspired word of God. In their own holy book, the Quran, this is written about the Bible. It was we who revealed the law to Moses. Therein was guidance and light. By its standards have been judged the Jews. By the prophets who bowed, as in Islam, to Allah's will, by the rabbis and the doctors of the law, for them was entrusted the protection of Allah's book, taken from Shura 5 verse 44. These words most directly relate to the Old Testament. The Quran, however, goes on to say this about the New Testament and its alignment with the Old Testament. It says, We sent Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the law, that had come before him. We sent him the gospel therein, was guidance and light and confirmation of the law that had come before him. That is from Surah 5 verse 46. The respect of Muslims for the Bible means that we can find common ground in the scriptures for testifying the claims of Islam. You see, Muslims claim that the Bible provides evidence for the validity of Islam. That's interesting. Let us then test some of these claims of Islam with regard to the Bible by examining them in the light of the Bible. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 8 makes an important statement about the authority of the Bible. Reading Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So the Bible is our only court of appeal. If what we say does not stack up against the Bible, it is not truth, it is error. It is not enlightening, it is darkness. But we do have a problem with using the Bible when speaking to Muslims. Islam says that 104 scriptures have been given through prophets. Of these 100 sacred books have been lost. The remaining four books are given to Moses, David, Jesus and Muhammad. The first three would equate to the Bible as we know it, while the last is the Quran. This might sound promising, as we have common ground, but Muslims believe that the Bible now available to us has been corrupted and therefore is not a reliable record. So in fact, although they profess to respect the Bible, it cannot be used to prove anything to a Muslim. Ironically, Muslims themselves use the Bible to make claims about Islam. I'd like to examine some of these claims. Our first example is found in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And in that chapter, God tells Moses that sometime future, he would raise up a special prophet like Moses. Jews have always seen this as a promise of the Messiah. And Christians recognise this passage as a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. Re we read these words in Deuteronomy 18, reading Deuteronomy 18, verses 17 to 19. 
And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them unto all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. This prophecy clearly says that a man would be provided by God from among the Jews who would speak the words of God and who would have supreme authority. This is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Muslim scholars do not agree with this interpretation. They claim that the prophecy was fulfilled in the person of Muhammad. In one text I read by a man named Ahmed Didat, he made these points to prove that this prophecy could not apply to Jesus because Jesus was not like Moses. He stated, Moses was a man, but Jesus is God. Moses did not die for the sins of the world, but Jesus did die for the sins of the world. Moses did not go to hell, but Jesus did go to hell for three days. The problem for Mr. Didat is that at least two of these points are invalid because they are based on an erroneous understanding of Christian doctrine. Trinitarians believe that Jesus is God, but the Bible does not teach this. On the contrary, the Bible says quite clearly that Jesus was a man. Mr. Didat is also wrong in relation to hell. The Bible concept of hell is the grave, so although the Bible never says so in these exact words, we may be certain that Moses did actually go to hell in the biblical sense. Ahmed Didat went on to claim that while there were important differences between Moses and Jesus, there are many parallels between Moses and Muhammad. These include Moses and Muhammad had a father and a mother. Jesus had only one human parent. Moses and Muhammad were born through natural processes. Jesus' birth was miraculous. Moses and Muhammad were married. Jesus was a bachelor. Moses and Muhammad were accepted by their people. Jesus was rejected. Moses and Muhammad died from natural causes. Jesus was executed. He concludes, therefore, that the prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 refers to Muhammad rather than to Jesus. Mr. Didat's conclusion, however, ignores three key elements of the passage. Let's look again at the words of verse 18 and consider carefully what they say. Firstly, verse 18, God says he will raise up the prophet. In other words, the prophet was not going to be someone who would be generated through a natural process. God himself would intervene in human affairs to raise up a prophet. This was fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ was begotten by the Holy Spirit and born of Mary. Secondly, verse 18 says this prophet would be an Israelite, one of their brethren, not an Arab. Jesus was the son of a Jewish mother, whereas Muhammad was an Arab. Thirdly, Mr. Didat's emphasis on the parallels between Moses and Muhammad is misplaced. Verse 18 says the prophet would be like unto Moses, not identical with Moses. Jesus was not identical to Moses, as Mr. Didat points out, but that does not mean he was not like Moses. Both men with a special mission from God. Both played key roles in God's redemptive plan for both and both provided guidance and worship for a lifestyle for the true servants of God. In conclusion on this point, please turn to the book of Acts. It seems clear that the prophecy must also relate to the Lord Jesus Christ rather than to Muhammad. And if there were any doubt, we have the evidence of the New Testament. In at least six places in the New Testament, this prophecy is specifically applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are at least four diff direct references in the Gospels. Matthew 11 verse 3, Luke 7 verse 16, John 1 verse 45 and John 6 verse 14. But we'll quickly look at just two instances in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 3, Peter is preaching to the Jews in Jerusalem. 
reading Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 23. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken of by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. There can, there can be no ambiguity about the person to whom Peter thought the prophecy in Deuteronomy applied to. It was Jesus, not Muhammad. We have seen that Muslims, Muslim claims about this key prophecy are mistaken. Their failure to recognise that this prophecy applies to the Lord Jesus Christ is reflected in other prophecies relating to Jesus Christ as the Messiah and Saviour. Come across please to Genesis 49. In Genesis 49 we have the final words of Jacob. These words are a prophecy about the future of the tribe of Israel and that shall descend from his twelve sons. Perhaps the most significant of these prophecies is that which relates to Judah, which we read in verses 8 to 10. Reading Genesis 49 verses 8 to 10. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is the lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. It is clear that Judah is to have a pivotal role in the destiny of Israel. From verse 8 we can discern that the Bible, the tribes of Judah, is to have special authority in the nation. So in what sense did Judah come to have special authority in Israel? This was fulfilled in Israel's history, when the royal house was established in the family of David, a man of the tribe of Judah. In the plan of God, it was determined that Messiah should be a descendant of Judah and should come specifically from the line of David. Verse 10 indicates that, although the kingdom would be disrupted, the throne would never pass to another tribe. When the Lord Jesus Christ was born, he was born into the family of David and the angel promised his mother he would sit on the throne of his father David. We know from other prophecies that he will reign from that throne forever and ever. As verse 10 suggests, all nations will be subject to him. The Lord Jesus Christ is therefore Shiloh, to which verse 10 refers. But Muslim scholars again say that Shiloh is a reference to Muhammad. They argue that Shiloh means peace, as does the name Islam. Those meanings might be valid, but the interpretation is at odds with the passage which clearly suggests that Shiloh will be from the tribe of Judah and that he will rule over the nations. This will be true of the Lord Jesus Christ when the kingdom of God is established on earth, but it is not true of Muhammad, a man who exercised rule over only a few tribes in his lifetime. In Psalm 110, we have another Messianic prophecy that Muslim scholars apply invalidly to Muhammad. Psalm 110 is a classic Masonic prophecy. We need to have no doubt about its interpretation because it is explained in the New Testament. Reading Psalm 110 verse 1. Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. David wrote this psalm and he speaks of someone in the future who is his Lord. If we go across to Matthew 22, 
we can see that the Muslims have the same problem with this verse that the Pharisees had in Jesus' day. You see, Muslim scholars ask how this could refer to Jesus, because if Jesus is a descendant of David, he could not be David's Lord. They conclude, therefore, that David's Lord in this place is actually Muhammad. In Matthew 22, the Lord Jesus Christ answers this very claim and shows them it is invalid. Reading Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 to 45. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he? his son. David could call his descendant Lord because in addition to being a son of David, Jesus was also the son of God. The Muslims repeat the same mistake made by the Jewish rulers in Jesus' day. They refuse to recognise the truth about the Messiah and they are reluctant to accept the logic of Messianic prophecies. Perhaps the most curious Muslim claim about the Bible is the suggestion that Muhammad's name is found in the Song of Solomon. The passage they use in Song of Solomon 5 is again, in fact, a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, but they see it as a reference to Muhammad. Reading Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely, this is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. The phrase altogether lovely represents the Hebrew word makmadim. Muslim scholars point out that this sounds rather like Muhammad, and that the word means the praised one, a term which they could apply to Muhammad. This is in fact spurious reasoning. Lots of words in different languages sound alike yet have no similar similarity or link. Secondly, the word makmadin does not mean the praised one. Rather, its primary meaning is an object of desire. It's found 13 times in the Bible. It's never used in the context, context of praise. It is always used of things which are desirable. We haven't time to look at them all tonight, but in the second of Chronicles, chapter 36 and verse 19, the word is used of things which are destroyed. In Isaiah 64 and verse 10, of things that are laid waste. In Lamentations 2 and verse 4, and Hosea 9 verse 16, of desirable men who were slain by God. For some reason, Muslim scholars do not find Muhammad's name in these passages, only in the Song of Solomon, even though the same noun is used in all cases. Isaiah chapter 29 is another passage some Muslim scholars claim refers to Muhammad. This is particularly a curious claim. If it were true, it would actually destroy the authority of Muhammad. Most Muslim scholars say that Muhammad was illiterate, although there is some doubt about this fact. Those who assume that he was indeed illiterate see these words in Isaiah 29 as applying to him. Reading Isaiah 29, verses 9 to 14. Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, 
For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvellous work among this people, even a marvellous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. The unlearned prophet in verse 12 is said to be Muhammad. The scholars argue that all of the biblical prophets could read and write, so this must be somebody else. This is a bizarre claim because Isaiah is referring to a false prophet, an erroneous teacher in this passage. In verse 10, the religious rulers had been lulled into sleep. They are blind leaders. God has forsaken these leaders because, as the prophet says in verse 13, they have taught the ideas of men rather than of God. If this were a prophet about Muhammad, it would demonstrate that Islam is a false religious system based on the teachings of man rather than God. It is indeed that, but it is not likely that Muslim scholars mean to understand it in this way. Now, amazingly, in Jeremiah 28, Muslims find another similar verse that they claim also is a prediction about Muhammad. In Jeremiah 28, there is a reference to a prophet of peace, and Muslims assert that this prophet must be Muhammad. Reading Jeremiah 28, verse 9. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. In this chapter, the prophet Jeremiah is in conflict with a false prophet named Hananiah. If you glance over verses 5 to 8, you will see that this man, Hananiah, had prophesied of peace and prosperity, whereas true prophets like Jeremiah had predicted war and tumult. In verse 9, Jeremiah rather sarcastically ridicules Hananiah's false prophet prophecy. This is another example of where Muslims have taken a reference to a false prophet and applied it to Muhammad. Finally, come across please to the book of Matthew. There are many claims made by Muslims in relation to the Bible. We've had a look at just a few of those from the Old Testament and seen that the claims are invalid. In conclusion, we'll look at one in the New Testament and see how this is also without foundation. In Matthew chapter 3, Muslim scholars claim that these words of John the Baptist are a reference to Muhammad. Reading Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptise you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Muslim scholars note that John the Baptist unreservedly acknowledged in this verse as the superiority of the one who would come after him. They then claim that John the Baptist did not become a follower of Jesus. So the person to whom he was referring must be somebody else. And in their view, it must be Muhammad. This reasoning is flawed. John the Baptist was imprisoned by Herod and beheaded about the time Jesus began his ministry. So there was no opportunity for him to become a follower of Jesus, the Messiah. As to the claims made in this verse, could we say that Muhammad bestowed the Holy Spirit upon his followers? The Quran makes no such claim. Certainly no one of his followers became a prophet. And, the, and on the other hand, the disciples of Jesus did receive the Holy Spirit and some of them were noted prophets. We have only had time this evening to consider a few of the claims made by Muslims about the Bible. We have seen those, that those claims are mistaken at best. Earlier in this address we quoted from Isaiah chapter 8, which said that if men's words were not in harmony with the law and the testimony, they are invalid. We have seen that the claims of Muslim scholars in relation to the Bible are not according to the law and the testimony of scripture. That proves there is no true light in their teaching. Islam is a religion that embodies the teachings of men rather than of God. On the whole, Muslim peoples are no better or worse than any other large group of peoples. Certainly, the ones with whom we have had dealings with have been honourable people. 
but their religion is founded on falsehood. Islam claims to respect Jesus, but its view of Jesus is totally corrupt. They refuse to recognise Jesus as the Son of God and regard it as blasphemous to say that God even had a son. Even more worrying is the fact that Islam cannot conceive of a God-loving man. Thus they cannot begin to understand the doctrine of atonement, which teaches that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. The problem with Islam, as with other false systems such as Orthodox Christianity, Buddhism or Humanism, is that, it, is that it is astray from the teaching of the Bible, which is the inspired and infallible word of God. In the case of Islam, in this address, we have seen that it is especially flawed when it comes to understanding the role of the Lord Jesus Christ in the plan and purpose of Almighty God. The Bible says that there is no other name under heaven whereby men may be saved. Muslims will never find salvation in Muhammad or in the religion he established. Like all other men, they can only find salvation if they come to an appreciation of the gospel message embodied in the Lord Jesus Christ as outlined in the Bible.